All right, immunologic emergencies. So our nice core competencies. Our priority here, our primary function here is our allergic reactions. Um, allergic reactions are run by our innate immune system or inborn immune system. They can complicate a... Um, they can be complicated by exposure to allergens, and then we create a, um, essentially a threat matrix, however you want to say it, to that disease or to that, or not disease, to that, um, that uh, chemical. And then with that, our body will constantly react to that same substance again in the future. What we're worried about in the pre-hospital setting is how this can turn into an anaphylactic reaction and start having systemic problems. Cardiovascular collapse, um, stuff like that. The big thing that we, I need you to learn, well, I would say that the big thing you need to learn is how to treat anaphylaxis, but after that, or you know, but in conjunction with that, learn how to recognize the difference between a normal or to a standard allergic reaction and an anaphylactic reaction because they're not treated the same and they they do not always present the same. Where's Oscar? Where'd he go? He was in here earlier. Where'd he go? Yeah. All right. So here's a number of different types of immune responses or immune problems that we will see. Hypersensitivity. This means something that should not cause a problem, something that should not create a reaction, um, causes a bit more of a response from you versus somebody else. No problem whatsoever. Maybe um, you're just more you show the symptoms or you show changes quicker to that sub to that substance it's not exactly the same thing but you could compare it to somebody having a low alcohol tolerance you know it doesn't take much to get them tipsy or whatever they're hypersensitive they're more sensitive than another person might be to that substance Allergic reactions are an actual inflammatory state where your body's immune system is reacting to that substance. This is generally going to be isolated. This is going to be, not generally, this is going to be isolated to the system that was affected and often the location that was affected. So this is like you put on uh, latex gloves, you have a latex or latex tape, and you have a latex allergies and it causes redness and inflammation right there on the scene or on the skin right where it was placed that would be an allergic reaction <clears throat> if it was just a little bit of redness that you might call that a hypersensitivity but it's not creating the itching and the hives and all that but let's say you put it on there and then they have a rash or hives on that arm or something and it, but it's still just skin and in that area, that would be your allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis is when more than one organ system is involved, and it almost always will involve respiratory, but it doesn't have to. But more than one organ system being the organ system that was affected, so like let's say you eat something that you're allergic to and you start vomiting, that's an allergic reaction. You put something on your skin that you're allergic to and you break out into hives. That's an allergic reaction. But you eat something you're allergic to, you start vomiting, or you don't vomit, but you break out into hives and you start having trouble breathing. That's anaphylaxis. You put something on your skin that you're allergic to, you break out into hives, okay? But then you start vomiting as well. Now you're having anaphylaxis, even though you're not trouble breathing, you're having more than one system so that's the anaphylaxis biphasic allergic reactions we don't going to worry about that in this course um 
distinguishing them from other reactions is not significant, and they're very long-term in their function. These are where you have patients who will suddenly react to like lisinopril or something after they've had it for a really long time, and now their tongue swells up. Anaphylactoid reactions look almost identical to anaphylaxis. And then we have collagen vascular diseases, which is like lupus and um, transport, or excuse me, transplant, which, you know, is your body attacks the transplanted organ. All right. So our immune system, we know you have humoral and we have cellular hu immunity. Cellular immunity is controlled by T cells. These are what attack and destroy we like killer T cells and helper T cells. These are great against viruses, cancers, and anything to, that is cellular based, like the in, invading organism is a cell. Um, or generally a large cell like your body cell or whatever. Most of our, uh, while bacteria are cells, most of our bact response to a bacterial infection is humoral based, where the B cells, B lymphocytes, are going to attack those organisms or those chemicals. Um, so with humoral immunity, we use, our body uses antibodies to control the invader or to uh, defend against the invader. And then um, phagocytosis through your lymphocytes, like your uh, macrophages and monocytes, I mean. But cellular immunity, the T cell actually does the destroying. The, the cell comes in contact with the organism and specifically takes that organism out. So in this course, the term allergen is just anything that creates a reaction. This could be a chemical, it could be food, it could be um, venom, um, yeah. Generally, we would consider, you know what, venom should not be considered an allergen. I should not say that because venom is going to be harmful one way or the other. Allergens are substances that are considered harmless in the general population, but have created a reaction for that person. I can eat eggs just fine. My daughter cannot. It's an allergen to her. It's not an allergen to me. Oh, antibodies are the chemicals that our body creates to fight that allergen. Allergens ha will get a matching antibody. Every antibody has an allergen. That allergen may be the proteins in milk or eggs, or it might be peanuts, or it might be bee venom, or it or bee um, yeah venom, or it might be um, any number of or um, penicillin. It may be the molecule in penicillin, but the antibody binds to that substance, creating a complex. That's your allergen antibody complex antibodies are also called immunoglobulins they float around in the plasma and they'll bind to things and they're constantly looking for stuff and they make it easier they're kind of like the scouts that put um target the invader so when they bind to it it attracts the macrophages and the monocytes to come and eat that or consume that invader so they make it easy for um the body for the white blood cells to destroy it this is gonna you'll see this again ige are what we're worried about that's the immunoglobulin immunoglobulin e although one of the least common immunoglobulins is the one that's responsible for allergic reactions in anaphylaxis all right, I already kind of mentioned this, local versus systemic reactions. Local, at the site of exposure, systemic, you got a tape or latex on your skin on your right hand, and now you have hives all over the body. It went from, instead of just being localized to the site of contact, it's systemic, it's everywhere. But it's not anaphylactic until it crosses into another organ system so multiple organ systems
like any chemical, how does it get into you or how into you? Anything else? Injected, absorbed, inhaled, ingested, whatever. All right. Um, useful information. <clears throat> All right, what happens when we're exposed to an allergen? Generally in the first event, the allergen enters our body and um, from there it, good grief, hang on. All right, so the allergen enters the body, and then our macrophages, which are the innate immune system, they're our natural immunity. They just, they're basically uh, white blood cells that travel through our body constantly looking for things they don't recognize. So macrophages come along, they see the, uh, this new substance, they engulf it, they consume it. And, um, if they if the body doesn't know what it is if the macrophage is like oh yeah we know that we've seen that before if it knows what it is it destroys it convert it's gone it's it's over it actually uses it for energy if it doesn't recognize the substance if it basically doesn't match any of the previous um antibodies re um produced then pieces of that product to that chemical whether it was a bacteria whether it was a chemical released by a bacteria or a food substance a protein whatever whatever that is get stuck on the outside of the macrophage and these macrophages are straight up out of a mad max movie so they're going along through life they find something that they don't recognize they slaughter it they eat it and if they recognize it, they move on. But if they don't recognize it, they stick its body parts all on the outside of their of the cell, and then they go back to their hive, which is the lymph node, and tell all of their buddies, "Yo, look what we found!" and share the pieces around to all of their buddies, and then all of the other macrophages and white blood cells start activating to that substance and the body creates a memory of that antibody and it says look there's a whole bunch more of them out there in the fingers so head out for the fingers and you will find your own once the body creates enough of those antibodies it runs away you know destroys the invasion then it stores those antibodies in your basophils and your mast cells these the mast cells are um, setting in different tissue, like in your subcutaneous tissue and your muscles and your GI tract and stuff. They're just placed in various parts of your body. And the basophils are white blood cells that travel around and circulate through your bloodstream. And they're just, they're, um, they're on lookout. And they're looking for things that have been recognized before. And if they want, and they are covered in, immunoglobulins in these little antibodies and if something connects to that antibody and, re and it recognizes that's an invader we know what that is it starts releasing a bunch of chemical histamine or chemical mediators chemical transmitters and those are like and histamine is the primary all right histamine is going to activate the inflammatory response causes the cells the vessels to dilate causes them to leak and it attracts more white blood cells to the area so more uh plasma cells that'll make a bunch of antibodies will come in more white blood cells that'll eat up the invader will come in and they all the blood rushes to that area because the vessels have dilated and then the fluid leaks out of the cell and or excuse me out of the vessel so that way all the white blood cells and the um, antibodies can all leave the bloodstream and go through the interstitial space to wherever the wound is or wherever the invading organism is and start destroying that organism.
here's a video or not a video here's a diagram of it so you have your basophil oh this is a mast cell mast cells are stationary basophils are going to be moving around this is it activates with the antigen starts to release the chemical mediators bronchoconstriction happens if it's in the lungs because it constricts the airway to prevent more more invaders from being breathed in kind of hurts because you know it kills us when that happens goes to if it's in the heart it slows the heart down re reducing contractility and decreasing blood flow to the heart so that it stops pumping the blood as fast so that we don't spread it but unfortunately that can kill us and it causes vasodilation wherever the inflammate the the site is so that the white blood cells can destroy the invading organism or the invading chemical that is what causes the redness the warmth the itching the um yeah yeah all those things All right. So first and foremost, when we're dealing with an immune response, an anaphylactic or whatever we call, we really want to make certain that whatever this person's reacting to is not going to affect us. All right. So if they got stung by bees, we don't want to show up and see if they're still in the area that these wasps or bees are. So make certain that we don't walk into a hazard. <clears throat> after that our level of consciousness i mean everything else is just like anybody else that we would um take care of abcs what's our general impression what's our level of consciousness airway move on N nothing nothing new there now in a serious allergic reaction scenario, we don't have a lot of time to play around when it comes to assessing the level of consciousness and such, um, and uh, airway and breathing. They can develop. They can be showing problems very quickly. All right. So an allergic reaction could be mild because it's only showing hives, itching, redness, swelling, or whatever at the site of the area of contact a moderate might be you have those same signs and symptoms redness itching swelling or whatever but spread throughout the entire body system again but still only one organ system severe reactions are the anaphylactic reaction and this is when multiple systems are um, activated and there's a reason i keep saying this over and over again okay allergic reaction is one anaphylactic is more than one system all right so the patient's breathing but you're hearing a lot of noise it's very loud breathing sounds um not just wheezing but they're <laughs> making a loud noise without you listening to their lungs that could be strider and that could indicate that their vocal cords are swelling their larynx is swelling now before strider develops the patient might start complaining of hoarseness or I have a raspy sounding voice because there's mild swelling and that mild swelling makes it hard for them to form their words with their vocal cord properly um some patients might talk about a tightness in their throat could be in there that could be epiglottic swelling um that could be laryngeal laryngeal swelling or they might feel like their tongue is numb or thick and they start talking like their tongue is swelling up oddly enough most of your anaphylactic reactions are not actually going to um, cause a swollen tongue. Um, but angioedema, angia, uh, angioedema is a, a form of allergic reaction uh, 
caused by a lot of different medications. And I've even seen it where only half of their tongue can swell. But that just causes the tongue to swell up on its own. Doesn't cause the strider, but if the tongue gets large enough, it can still block the airway off completely. Early on, you might start to hear some wheezing. You have good air sound or air movement, but then the wheezing starts to develop as the bronchioles constrict. And then as the bronchial constriction progresses, you might get silent lung because there's no air being moved through those lung fields anymore. All right. Um, and then our focus, honestly, is not so much on what's their skin color and condition. You know, do they have itching, uh, redness, swelling, hives? Our, my concern with the skin is it... Um, flush in general do we have pul what's their pulses um because with an anaphylactic shock you do not have pale cool clammy skin they're not vasoconstricting and shunting blood to the core like a hypovolemic patient they're vasodilated they're flush warm skin causing a relative hypotension just like your neurogenic shock and your septic shock because these people have distributive it's a form of distributive shock um if you're seeing multiple organ systems involved if it's more than the initial thing let's say a patient inhales dust and they're allergic to that dust and they start wheezing because they inhaled the dust that's one organ system I might treat that a little bit more aggressive than maybe somebody who rubbed up against a, um, a, a plant that causes a reaction or has a late, latex irritation on their skin. You know, I might give them dialbuterol and maybe even consider epi for that patient just because it's in the lungs. But um, if you're dealing with a single system, they may not need to go to the hospital. If you're dealing with multiple systems, by the time you arrive on scene, do not waste time. Just load them up and deal with everything in, tr in transit. These, pr these uh, conditions can develop very rapidly. Um, typically speaking, the longer it's been from time of onset or from time of exposure to symptom onset, the longer that is, the less severe the reaction is going to be. Have they ever had a reaction like this before? Have they been ever, ever been exposed to this substance before? If so, how did this exposure, how did this incident compare to previous incidents? What was done for them last time? Have they been intubated? Were they hospitalized? Not taken to the ER, but spent the night in the hospital or gone to the ICU? Do they take an EpiPen? Do they own an EpiPen, carry it with them? Have they used epi? Have they taken any other medications? Benadryl, albuterol, um, aerosolized uh, um, epi, like um, racemic epi. We don't normally see that one, but it is possible. When your patient has a severe reaction, we don't really care what the react what caused it the focus is treatment because the treatment's the same no matter what it was whether it was shellfish whether it was a bee sting whether it was peanuts whether it was dust or latex condom nobody cares they're having an allergic re anaphylactic reaction we have to focus on that it is important to remember these patients who have a history of mild to moderate allergic reactions can easily panic and overreact with an exposure leading to instead what looks like an anaphylactic reaction but in all honesty is just a panic attack and we want to be very objective in our assessment to make certain that when the patient says they have trouble breathing well let's listen to their lungs what's their heart what's their respiratory rate what's their heart rate do we hear wheezes? Do we hear strider? Do we have difficulty swallowing? Or um, do we have evidence of swelling? Do you have rash and hives and things like that? Don't base your don't base your decisions purely on the subjective um, symptoms. 
use the objective signs. What what are you actually seeing? Um, because you you don't want to uh, pop somebody with epi when really they were just having an, a panic attack because they were afraid of having an allergic reaction. <clears throat> I think that goes without saying. I've worked the allergic reactions that the patient was just having a full-blown anxiety attack. I have worked them where the patient stopped breathing and was in full anaphylactic shock, and we were bagging them by the time we got to the hospital. I've you know seen the whole gamut. And they can change very quickly. Um... The one I can remember bagging, the guy walked to the ambulance. He practically met us at the door. Yes, he was having um, shortness of breath and concerned, but we were bagging him by the time we got to the hospital. Uh, try to get your vital signs early. Remember, the allergic react, a true anaphylactic patient is going to be lower heart rate and low blood pressure because the histamine reaction release is going to slow the heart rate down and decrease their contractility. So um, they're very dis they're distributive shock. Uh, they will have wheezing and difficulty breathing, but it uh, but they'll probably start increasing their respiratory rate trying to um, um, uh, compensate for that difficulty breathing. This says that their pulse rates may increase. That can happen um, early on, like when they're first happening, and that's actually a good sign because it means epi is pumping. But um, but they're they're going to have that weak pulse because the histamine release weakens the contractility and dilates the vessels, so they don't have much of a blood pressure. Um, do all of the assessments that you can, but. Focus on intervention. So if your patient is already presenting with anaphylactic symptoms, your focus needs to be your epinephrine injections, albuterol treatments, um, diphenhydramine, solumedrol, and then fl and fluids. Think about the medication that you're giving. What is it you're giving? Why are you giving it? What should it change? Based on what it should change is what you want to reassess. You gave epi. It's supposed to cause vasoconstriction and bronchial dilation. So their skin, their pulse should get stronger and their breathing should get easier. Their wheezing should become less. If you pop them with the epi and it got a little bit better, but then didn't and then got worse again that doesn't mean it didn't work it just means you need more you that was your first dose now you have to do more so keep a very close eye on these patients as you you give them the treatment and then did the, do you see any improvement whatsoever sometimes they improve that one dose everything's great other times you gave them the dose they got a little bit better but then they start getting worse again so that means you have to do repeat doses in case you hadn't learned yet how to call in a report. All right. I think we've stressed this to the max. Get the epi on board. Most of the time, if it's mild, they may need Benadryl. Probably take Benadryl at home and not need to go to the hospital at all. All right. Hypersensitive immune system, you've been exposed to the substance before. The second time you expose, your immune system goes cuckoo and um, just calls an all hands on deck and your body's natural defense mechanisms start harming it. Because instead of those defense mechanisms functioning in a single location in the in an isolated area of exposure, they have spread to the entire body. Histamine is being released not just where 
you were exposed to latex on that hand, but now the histamine is being released all over the entire body. And so instead of just your hand um, swelling, everything's swelling. So there's some um, hives showing the welts on the wheels from uh, the, created by the histamine and the dilation of the vessels there. When you have um, anaphylaxis, that histamine dilation can happen to all the vessels. So you may not actually see localized swelling like that or um, very clearly defined wheels because it's all of the vessels everywhere dilating out. Now, leukotrienes are similar to histamine. They are a different chemical. They are longer lasting. And if they activate or when they activate, they're the ones that are a lot harder to deal with. So histamine is very rapid onset, um, but they're easier to deal with. Leukotrienes, on the other hand, they last a lot longer, have a lot bigger concerns. Um, we in pre-hospital are not going to know, are we dealing with leukotrienes or are we dealing with histamines? And so our focus is the steroids, which are going to combat both antihistamines, which are only a histamine, and then epi. Epi doesn't stop a leukotriene. It doesn't stop a histamine. Epinephrine simply reverses the, the th problems that histamines cause. So if histamines cause the vessels to dilate, the epinephrine uses a different mechanism, a different pathway to cause the vessel to constrict. So you're just trying to balance, uh, balance the two out. All right. Um, so, like I said, it is a um, patients with anaphylaxis are having a distributive shock. Um, it may also look like cardiogenic shock in that it weakens the heart. The hypovolemic shock, at least initially, is relative because the vessels dilated. As the vessels dilate and they become more permeable and fluid shifts, you might have a, a decrease in fluid volume. And so there's sort of a hypovolemia. But um, the big issue here is that their um, blood pressure is low because their vessels are large, are dilated, and their heart is um, contractions are weak. That's the concern. So we're going to give epi to constrict the vessels, and we're going to give fluids to fill them back up. All right, so um, syncope, you know, heat stress, um, asthma, other respiratory conditions, MSG poisoning. These are all a whole bunch of other uh, ACE inhibitor. That's the lisinopril. Um, <clears throat> these are a lot of other similar reactions that are not anaphylactic. Um, most of these, I think, you can uh, rule out as um, pretty quickly as to what's going on. The issue is, when did it start? What, what was going on before it happened? Um, sometimes your, your, like your ACE inhibitor stuff or your red man syndrome, um, to literally the, the patient like skin turns bright red. Um, these are the reactions of like uh, medications. Uh, antibiotics being a pr common, um, culprit, but uh, anaphylaxis, the one you're really worried about is how it affects the lungs and the cardiovascular system. So kind of look to that as being the problem, as to being the rule out, which, which, is, which is the cause. All right, an allergic reaction, no respiratory distress, one single organ system involved, 
give them Benadryl. They can take it PO. They could take um, Benadryl pills. They can take you know 25 to 50 milligrams or a liquid Benadryl, whichever they decide. Um, or you can give them a IM or IV injection of Benadryl. Either one works. Uh, keep an eye on them. If they take their own Benadryl, oftentimes before we even arrive on scene, there's really no reason to for them to go to the hospital, especially if they have people to be there with them. Um, I had a coworker who was allergic to legumes. He could not eat beans. Well, not only could he not eat beans, he could not be in the area that beans were cooking. So if we were making like red beans and rice and the, the boiling the beans, that aerosolization, aerosolization of the beans proteins would cause him to react. And one night he started reacting bad and then he had to go out on a call. He comes back from his call and he's got a bottle of liquid Benadryl and he's just sipping, drinking the Benadryl, just like uh, Will Smith in um, Hitch. Uh, when did that come out? Like early 2000s, like 2005, 2006, whatever. Anyway, he's sitting there drinking a bottle of Benadryl around the station. We're like, it was all swollen up and puffy. You're like, dude, you need to go home. And he's like, no, nah. okay. It's just, it's just swollen. Like, you look worse than your patients, do you scare people? He's like, well, at least you know, if I stop breathing, you can help me. I'm like, okay, great. All right. Um, Obviously, if whatever's causing the reaction, if it's like tape or latex or a, a bee or powder, whatever, get, you know, try to get rid of it. And that should be easily thought of. Hoarseness will show up before strider. They might, sometimes these develop very rapidly, but it might take a while before it starts being notable. Uh, just because the patient has uh, an exposure, I'm not jumping directly to the epi. If I start to hear wheezes, if I see significant respiratory uh, rate increases in distress, then epi is a good idea. But again, you really want to make sure you're not popping a panic attack with um, with, uh, with with epinephrine. So um, if you're using a, uh, a auto injector, this is okay. You can shoot an auto injector through their clothes. Just remember, orange to the patient. Do not put your finger on the orange side. You will stick the needle in you. Um, if you're using a... Uh, uh, if you're drawing up your own Epi 1 to 1000... 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams, 0.3 to 0.5 milligram, milligrams, which for 1 to 1,000 is also 0.3 to 0.5 milliliters. Um, if it's a severe case, the patient's really reacting, you can go IM into their shoulder. Uh, we used to do sub-Q epi. It used to be recommended to do sub-Q. Uh, Sub-Q slower absorption. IM is fine. There's nothing wrong with going IM. It's faster absorption. Uh, State of Georgia protocol now say IM. Don't even worry about sub-Q. Um, go ahead and use that. If the patient has their own EpiPen but has not used it, use your Epi. Those EpiPens are retardedly expensive. Like There's no reason on earth they should cost that. So don't, don't use their $600 EpiPen when you could use your $6 um, Epi vial. All right, start an IV. Give fluids. Get some fluids running in there, especially if they're showing the shock symptoms. Uh, IOs are fine for this. If you can't, if they're in a bad enough shape that you cannot get an IV, um, which generally these patients are dilated, they're not constricted. So getting an IV shouldn't be that hard. Um, but if you can't, IO is okay. 
but lots of fluids, uh, Benadryl, IV. Um, if I think it's anaphylaxis, I'm doing epi first through the IM route and then get the IV and do the um, Benadryl. Um, and then any subsequent doses, any additional doses of epi I have to do, I can actually do with 1 to 10,000, 0.1 milligram of 1 to 10,000 um, in uh, the IV. You can actually use um, IV epi for anaphylaxis, but it has to be diluted, the 1 to 10,000 dilution. Because I need to get, uh, if they're anaphylactic, it progresses so quickly. I want to get that epi on board fast. And I can draw it up and pop it IM in their shoulder or their thigh you know, a lot quicker than I can start the IV and do all that. If the patient has the reaction, I already have an IV established for some reason, I can use the IV in the first place. Um, and Benadryl, like I said, Epi, um, you can also use, um, albuterol. Albuterol helps, uh, dilate the bronchioles. The Epi is going to do that too. Um, so there's not much, there's nothing wrong with giving them an albuterol nebulizer. Um, and immunosuppressants are your, or anti-inflammatories, those are your steroids. So whether you use Decadron or Solumedrol, Prednisone, something like that, those, those are your other options. Even if your treatments are effective, the patient still does need to go to the ER because um, recurrent reactions or your medication could wear off or um yeah a number of different things could take place and you really should they should be evaluated by a doctor all right um lupus um the autoimmune disorders uh i'm gonna link i'm gonna send you an email with the link to those videos uh to that video where i cover this chapter you, um you watch that part there. Um, so I'm not going to get into a lot of these uh, collagen vascular diseases uh, here. Now, organ transplants. Occasionally, we will come in contact with a patient who has had an organ transplant and their body is rejecting the organ. They may have had the transplant two years ago, three years ago, and now their body is rejecting it. This could be because they stopped taking their anti-rejection medications. It could be that they have some kind of illness or infection uh, that caused their anti-rejection medications not to be um, adequate. It could mean that there's some other disease process that's preventing them from um, using the anti-rejection uh, medication, like uh, a liver um, disease or a kidney failure or something like that, If assuming that that wasn't the organ transplanted. But how do we know what's going on? Well, anytime a patient has had an organ transplant, and then that organ is rejected, the symptoms of rejection are identical to that organ system failure. So if a patient has had a heart transplant, they're gonna look like they're having heart failure when it's rejected. Liver, liver failure. Kidney transplant, renal failure. Um, the one I'm wishing that we could figure out is brain transplant and how all these people have had brain transplants because there's a lot of people with brain failure out there right now. Excuse me. Because of the way the uh, heart transplants work, they have to sever the vagus nerve. Epinephrine, excuse me, epinephrine will work, but atropine will not because the vagus nerve does not have an effect on the new um, heart that's been transplanted. Um, Another thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with your organ transplant patients is that organ uh, is theoretically the hospital system or the health system that provided it for them. That's, it, that health system can 
essentially dictate what that patient can and can't do with their life in order to preserve that organ. And so if you pick a patient up and they're like, oh yeah, I had a heart, heart transplant at Emory, um, then you're going to need to take that patient back to Emory for anything uh, related to that. So our focus is going to be on what does that organ system do? What does that organ do? And how would we um, deal with the symptoms of that um, organ failure? Whether, you know, is it a fluid problem? Is it oxygenation, ventilation, electrolyte balances? Um, things like that. You know, oxygenation issues to ventilate them. So look for the symptoms that mimic the original organ failure. Transport them back to the facility that did the transplant and intervene on life threats related to their um, the symptoms, right? <clears throat> yeah and that pretty much is what we do um most of the time there's not much else that we're we're gonna deal with um When a patient, when we're dealing with patients uh, with anaphylaxis, we really do want to um, encourage them to wear their med alert, medical alert tags or um, jewelry or whatever, because those are, um, if their symptoms become severe, those might be the only way some that somebody will be able to understand that's what's going on. They also need to learn to carry their anaphylactic, anaphylaxis kits with them. Uh, leaving your EpiPen in your truck or in your refrigerator at your home is not going to do you any good if you decide to go out in the woods hunting and you're allergic to bees or hornets. Um, early reporting symptoms. Oh, it probably won't be that bad this time. I'll just keep an eye on it. No. Get help coming quickly. You can always cancel the help. You, don't, you do not need to wait until it's too late or really bad. <clears throat> biphasic reactions is where everything was doing um they they had a reaction and then things got better but then they have a second reaction often the leukotrienes being activated coming in a few hours later causing a very severe recurrence um so those are uh, some of the things that we want to educate them to look for this is why why um we uh yeah we keep a really close eye on uh, those. We, we have to encourage those patients to go to the ER and not just ignore the warning signs. Um, all right.